episode number five with the Cookie King, Michael J. Coles. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Michael Coles. Michael is a successful entrepreneur, investor, advisor, and community leader. He co-founded the Great American Cookie Company and grew it into the largest franchiser of cookie stores with 350 locations and sales of over $100 million when he sold the company. He was also CEO of Caribou Coffee, which became a publicly traded company under his realm. He's a big supporter of Kennesaw State University, whose business program is fittingly named the Michael J. Coles College of Business. Michael, my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Good to be here. Did you always know you were going to be an entrepreneur? Were you entrepreneurial as a kid? Were your parents entrepreneurial? Where did all this come from? Well, I I would say that, yeah, I was always entrepreneurial, and I remember my first business was when I was uh, 11 years old. Uh, I, my father went bankrupt when I was 10. And I, we lost, he virtually lost everything. And so I had to start working, not to buy things for myself, but that literally to give money to my family. And so my first job that I had was a leaf raking business. And then in the wintertime, I figured I would shift all those accounts uh, to be snow shoveling business. Well, I, it, was, it was like a lot of things in my life. I didn't really understand the difference between the two businesses. In the leaf raking business, people don't need, it's not an immediate thing that has to happen. So you have days to, to take care of the leaves. But when the snow falls, people expect their driveway and their sidewalk done that day. Now, I was a little kid, and so if I could do two driveways a day on the sidewalks, it was a lot. But I had like 12 customers. And so most of my friends who lived in the neighborhood, uh, they went around trying to get snow shoveling businesses, and I had them. And so they were pretty upset. So I hired them to work for me, and I took a cut of what we got paid. And I ran that business as a kid, uh, not knowing that was pretty entrepreneurial and, in fact, possibly like a franchise business, I guess, in some ways. So you actually stopped shoveling snow and were just managing the snow shovelers. Exactly. Yeah. I never shoveled another walk. As a matter of fact, I, I don't think I ever shoveled another walk my entire life after that. It was pretty tough, tough doing. You know, first of all, it's wet snow. It's heavy. I was little. and But, it, you know, it was, I did that. And then my second venture was uh, a summer in the summer where kids would set up these little stands Uh, to sell their old toys and possibly even some of their parents' old stuff. Uh, I did that and sold out and still didn't have enough money to buy this little hockey game, uh, football game, vibrating football game I wanted to get. And so I went around the neighborhood and I bought out other kids' stands and then brought it back to my house and set up a a mega uh, garage sale before there were garage sales. So. This is eBay before there was eBay. Yeah, it was, you know, and so I guess I have always been entrepreneurial, but I was very lucky when my family moved to, uh, we moved to Florida, uh, Miami Beach, actually. And uh, when I was 14 years old, uh, I went to work at a clothing store that I used to sometimes be able to shop at. And a guy named Irving Settler, uh, who became my mentor and probably, Everything I've ever learned in my life, I learned the six years I worked for this guy. He was an amazing entrepreneur and um, just taught me everything. And obviously, I've learned since, but uh, if, it weren't for, if it weren't for Irving, I don't know where my life would have gone. It would have been a very different life. And I want to come back to this theme of mentoring, because I know you're a big advocate of people seeking mentors and yourself also being a mentor. But having had that taste of the entrepreneurial life and everything positive that comes from it, and, and granted, you were 11, 12 years old, 
but did that taste give you a sense that this is my future, this is my destiny, this is what I'm going to do one day, or were there a whole other set of circumstances that would eventually lead to that? I think from the time I was about uh, 18 or 19, I always knew that I would do something on my own. I never imagined in my whole life that I, you know, that I would grow up to be Willy Wonka, you know, with my cookie business. And, uh, but it was just, you know, it's just one of those sets of circumstances. Let's dig into this. So at the time you decided to start the company, you had a successful career, you're married, you had three kids, everything was quote unquote normal by anyone's uh, set of criteria. You certainly could have found some sort of job closer to home if, if the issue was just the travel, but you decided, eh, let me throw caution to the wind and go ahead and start a company. So why risk it all? What was the motivation of starting a company at that point in your life? Well, for, first of all, um, one of the things you left out in the, in the, in the intro, you know, you hear we grew the company with $100 million, but what you left out was the fact we started the company with $8,000. Uh, and we borrowed twenty five thousand dollars to open the first store, and we never borrowed any more money after that. And, and by the way, because I did the math, this was started in the seventies. That eight thousand is about thirty two thousand in today's dollars, which still is not much money. In many ways, because we didn't have a lot of money, it caused us to make very careful decisions. But let me take let me take a step backwards here. First of all, we got, I went into the cookie business. I was never expecting it to be my business. I went into the cookie business to have a business that would throw off some income while I was figuring out what I was really going to do with the rest of my life. I never imagined that I was going to be in the cookie business. I thought I would, you know, I was looking at a lot of opportunities at the same time I was getting ready to open our first store. And then, you know, many people know my story. I had a motorcycle accident yeah, six weeks after we started the cookie company. I had, I was basically woke up in the hospital and Dr. Sin standing over my bed telling me I was going to live. What happened was I couldn't do anything else. I mean, it was like... But didn't you start the company before the accident? Six weeks. Well, the, the company was six weeks old when I had my accident. And so I was on a, you know, I was on a walker. Uh, I was on canes for almost two years, and I couldn't do anything else. So I had to focus on the cookie business. But when you started, so you started this cookie business to throw off some income, to buy yourself some time, essentially, put yourself in a holding pattern until you found out some other career move. Exactly. But, but why, <laughs> you know, why a cookie business? There are a thousand things you could do to have some interim income, and you decided, oh, I'm, I'm going to start a cookie business, which which today it seems normal, but back then it's not like there were a whole bunch of cookie stores out there and the malls weren't filled with, with you know, little cookie stands. So what was behind that? So uh, I was in California and I was still in the clothing business in 1977, in the spring of 77. And I uh, had customers that would come to my hotel room uh, to show my clothing line, uh, which was my own company at the time. Uh, by the way, called the Great American Clothing Company. And so while I was out there, <clears throat> I, I would buy, you know, snacks to serve customers. And so I went to a mall, and I literally walked into the mall, and I just saw a store. I had no idea what it was with a line of about 30 or 40 people standing in line. And I went down to see what it was, and it was a cookie store in a mall. And so I got in line like everybody else and I got up to the counter and I started talking to the manager of the cookie store, asking him questions. And of course I was holding up the line. So he said, I'll come out and I'll talk to you. So this guy started, he answered every question I asked, how much business are you doing? Uh, what's, what's the cost structure? You know, what's your food cost? What's your labor cost? And he answered them all. And the truth is, when he told me what the food cost was, I didn't believe him. So I left the mall, and I went to a grocery well, store. You didn't believe him because? It was so low. I couldn't believe that any business. Cause remember, I'm, I came out of the clothing business. I knew what our margins were. You know, he's telling me that, you know, the food cost is 15 20% with an 80% profit on a cookie. And I frankly didn't believe it. it. Seemed too good to be true. Too good to be true. 
So I left the mall and I went to a grocery store and bought all the ingredients to make my chocolate chip cookie recipe. I went next door to the grocery store and to a drugstore and bought a postage scale. And I weighed out all the ingredients to see if the food cost was even close to what this guy said based on his selling price. And I was amazed that it was. So I, when I flew back to Atlanta, I said to Donna, my wife, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, but while we're figuring out what we're going to do, let's open up a cookie store and, you know, we'll go from there. And that was it. I mean, my intention was to open a store. So the fact that this became a thriving business, that this became your future was somewhat fortuitous. That wasn't the intent going into it. No, but, you know, I've always said this, that sometimes opportunity will hit you right square in the face and you don't even see it. And for me, that's exactly what it was. My concept of doing a cookie store was so different than there were about two or 300 cookie stores at that time in the United States. The way we did cookies was completely different than the people that were out there. Most of the people that were in the business came out of the bakery industry. And so they're, they weren't retailers. I grew up as a retailer. My stores, our stores, our cookie stores, could have just as easily been selling clothing as cookies. There was a lot of, lot of merchandise, always having promotions, a lot of interesting things up on the walls to point you in the direction of, of upselling. You know, we, if you ever been, if you were certainly at a bakery at that point, if you went into a bakery and ordered a loaf of rye bread and you wanted a French bread to go with it, you had to say it quick because the minute you ordered the rye bread, they were ringing it up at the register. There was no suggestive selling. And so we brought a lot, you know, a lot of retail, traditional retail to the cookie business. And I'm sure that's why we succeeded. Uh, the other reason was that I recognized from the very beginning Everyone called it an impulse business. That's why you got to get this flavor, the smell out into the mall. I knew from the very beginning, if we relied on it being an impulse business, we'd never go anywhere. Uh, you, you know, you just can't rely on impulse. It's okay to have some. We had to figure out a way to make it a destination business. And that's when we created the, the big, uh, you know, the cookie cakes. Uh, large decorated cookies for birthdays and Valentine's Day and all of that. And that became about 40% of our business. And so you weren't, that was not an impulse item. I want to back up for a minute because before you had the cookie cakes and before you had all these franchisees and before you had a business, it was you and an idea and a little bit of research and uh, some ingredients in a, in a cookie formula. You didn't have your first store. So walk us through the pitch of getting that first lease? What did you have to do? Because I got to imagine they're looking at you like, who, who is this guy? And what are you trying to do? And we, we've got other opportunities to fill up our mall. So what, what happened there? Well, you're exactly right. Most malls didn't think, and, and, and rightfully so, that a cookie store could do enough business to pay the rent in a mall. Because the average cookie store back then was probably doing $150,000 a year. And so um, we knew we could do a lot better than that based on the concept that we had. And so when we went, we went to every mall in Atlanta and nobody would even talk to us about a space because they were like, you know, two guys out of the clothing business with $8,000 and there's two, three, you know, there's three major chains out there. Why would they give, you know, back then, you know, I was like, why wouldn't they give us a space? Well, today I can look back at it and go, why would they give us a space? But, you know, uh, you asked how we got our space. We begged for it. Perimeter Mall, was very, was not, it was a very poor mall at the time. It was not doing well. They brought in this new hotshot manager, a guy named Jeff Weil, who became a very good friend, who basically took a chance on us after sitting with us and finally just realizing we weren't going to leave his office. Uh, until he leased us a space. By the way, when you say that, you're not saying that metaphorically. You literally were in the office. And you, from what I understand, you planted yourself in the seat and you said, I'm not leaving till I have a chance to meet with that, that gentleman. We showed up in the morning without an appointment and the receptionist, you know, we could hear her side of the conversation, which was, you know, he would call and say, are they still here? I assume that's what he was saying because she would say, yes, they're still here and they don't appear to be leaving. And finally, when he came out, 
uh, of his office, we just jumped on him and basically said, we just want five minutes of your time. We want to tell you about our concept in a different way of doing cookies. And so he finally, you know, uh, acquiesced and gave us a chance. You beg your way into the lease. You get everything set up. And I heard a story about a little incident that happened. Was First it the opening day. Let's, let's hear yeah, about this. So opening day, um, we didn't have any money to advertise and we were the first cookie store in Atlanta. And so nobody really knew what a cookie store was. So we went around the neighborhoods around perimeter mall and we get passed out flyers announcing our opening. And we went to all the mall employees and gave them a flyer telling them, you know, which, which by itself would not be enough. But the hook was that from nine o'clock in the morning till 12 noon, we would give away free cookies. And we figured if we could get people to come and taste our cookies, they would come back and buy them. So we showed up at the mall about 7 o'clock in the morning, and by you know 8.15, we got ready to put our first batch of 300 cookies into the oven. And we had a big oven with, a revol- with like a revolving um, wheel in it. It was like a Ferris wheel. And you could, with a window in the front, so you could, we had a gate, but you could you could look into the window and you could actually watch the cookies bake. So we put that first batch of 300 cookies into the oven, and people out in the mall, by this point there were a couple hundred people out there, uh, and they had their faces pressed up against the gate, watching these cookies go from what looked like little dough balls to eventually flattening out and starting to crack. And at the moment the bell went off. Uh, 15 minutes after we put the cookies in, they had reached the most beautiful golden brown color you have ever seen. It's a color that only belongs to chocolate chip cookies. And people out in the mall, when they heard the bell go off, got very excited because they knew it meant any minute now they were going to get these delicious golden brown chocolate chip cookies. And we all put our hand on the oven door in a symbolic gesture. We're about to begin our business. And we opened up the oven door and looked at those beautiful 300 golden brown chocolate chip cookies. And at that moment realized we had no potholders. We had planned for everything, but no way to get the cookies out of the oven. And so we had no rags. We had no napkins. We had nothing. Now, people out in the mall have no idea what's going on, but they're just watching the cookies continue to go round and round going from this beautiful golden brown color to a much darker shade of brown to eventually catching fire I mean, you're on, just helpless. on their You're trace. just watching this We're whole thing unfold. completely helpless, completely helpless. Smoke poured out of our oven. Uh, we're on a combined air conditioning system with Park Lane Hosiery. People were running out of Park Lane Hosiery screaming. The fire department came because obviously smoke set off every smoke detector in the mall. And I remember standing behind the counter watching Jeff Wilde and mall manager coming towards our store uh, who didn't have much confidence in us to begin with, but gave us a chance. And he looked in and thank God the gate was down. He looked in and said, is this what it's going to be like every day, guys? And we wound up not opening that day. We wound up having to spend the whole day and night cleaning up this big soot mess uh, in the store. He was probably questioning his own decision to give you the lease to begin with. We were questioning our own decision as well, yeah. For sure, he was questioning it. So in our first 30 days of business, we needed to do $12,000 to break even. Uh, we did over $30,000 that in those first 30 days. We went in 30 days from being the highest grossing cookie concept in the United States, which caused people from mall owners from all over the country coming to Atlanta and offering her. We didn't have to go begging anymore for locations. People were offering us space. And we had people applying for franchises, even though we weren't selling franchises. And frankly, didn't even know what a franchise was. And like you're saying, this mall wasn't even that much of a happening mall at the time. That's it was right. somewhat dead compared to others. So was it the novelty of the concept here, because those others you mentioned weren't in Atlanta? Or was it back to your point about we knew how to merchandise and promote better than others, and so we created some sort of a hoopla around this? We, we were getting probably the highest percentage of customers that were passing by. I mean, my mother, who was tenacious, we were probably the first food company in the United States to sample. My mother was right on that lease line handing out samples of cookies, and which was never done before. No one did that. 
And my mother was out there hawking people into the store. And between that, and we opened, by the way, with cookie cakes. We, the original store was designed with those cakes uh, in a showcase, like a jewelry store. And the thinking behind the cakes was what exactly? You know, like, uh, you know, most mostly it was birthdays, you know, happy birthday. Have you ever been to a if you've ever been to a kid's birthday party where they serve cake? Kids eat icing. They don't eat the cake. They hate cake. So when we started selling cookie cakes and people found out they bring that to a kid's party. And no party, one else, you didn't steal that from someone else. No, no one else we was created doing that. No, we created it. Yeah. People would be amazed. There'd be nothing left. I mean, no crumbs, nothing. The kids would eat everything. They loved it. And the thing that was so cool about it is that it was so different. You know, at the time, now it's, you know, now it's accepted. But at the time, I mean, that was drawing people in. In the first month we were open, we did a wedding cake. I, I, we did a three-tier cookie wedding cake for somebody. And, you know, it was, uh, it was fun. It was different. And so the store did exceptionally well. And, uh, you know, the rest is cookie history. So moving past that initial sequence into once you became a business customers, expanding the business, growing. Was it pretty much a, a straight trajectory upwards or were there some major challenges along the way? Did you come close to bankruptcy at any point? We were pretty aggressive uh, based on the success of Perimeter Mall. And so we, within a month of opening Perimeter, uh, in that first 30 days where we had done so well, we signed a lease uh, with another mall called Greenbrier. And we had gone down there and done traffic studies. And the traffic at Greenbrier was four or five times what the traffic was at Perimeter Mall. And to show you how naive we were, we didn't even know about disposable income or anything like that. We just assumed Chick-fil-A had just opened in the mall, their first store. And people were like lined up to buy Chick-fil-A sandwiches. And our location was right next door. And we figured if Perimeter Mall is doing eight to ten thousand a week, this store is going to do twenty thousand a week. And so we pushed forward to open that store at the same time I had my motorcycle accident. And so I was literally building and opening Greenbrier on a walker. And um, a store opened and was doing less than two thousand a week. And we couldn't afford it to lose money. We had no money. I remember $8,000 is how we started Perimeter Mall. And so I had to spend most of my time watching Perimeter, watching Greenbrier and trying to figure out what, what was wrong. Well, it was pretty immediate. Delta Airlines headquarters were right behind Greenbrier Mall at the time. And so at lunchtime, those Delta employees would come to the mall, to, a lot of them to eat. And when we were measuring traffic, that's when we went to the mall. We happened to we didn't know that at the time. We just saw all these people. You were extrapolating from a small sample size that happened to be the, the peak capacity, if you will, of the mall exactly. during that period. You know? Yeah. So to make a long story short, um, I brought in a new manager, a very young, aggressive guy. Uh, after about a month, I brought in a new manager and immediately we went to about 3000 a week in sales. We still were losing a little bit of money, but not a lot. And I figured out how to streamline the operation. We just had too many people uh, because I was basing it on the way we operated perimeter. And so as I streamlined that operation, it didn't affect sales. In fact, sales started to go up because more and more people were starting to recognize who we were and coming to the store. That store never did what Perimeter did, but we eventually got that store up to about $4,500 a week uh, over a period of time. But more importantly than that, when we got it to $3,000 a week, $150,000 a year, that store was making money. Well, you know, I'm not a rocket scientist, but it didn't, it, someone didn't have to, you know, hit me over the head. Maybe I should go look at Perimeter Mall and see if that same sloppiness is existing there and could we streamline the way we operated a perimeter. And so I went to back to perimeter and used the same kind of value in operations 
to run perimeter and perimeter mall went from making about 20% to about 30% on its revenue and never missed a beat. Well, it goes to show that you can do all the planning in the world. Sometimes you have to be thrown in the fire to see what your blind spots are and know how to correct them. And, you know, had you spent another three months or six months before you opened the first store, it wouldn't have told you a lot of these things that you found out once you're, you're in operating mode. Well, here's the lesson. The lesson is people will always say, you know, Perimeter Mall is the reason you guys succeeded because it did so well from the very beginning. And my argument is no. The reason the company succeeded was because of Greenbrier. Greenbrier was like a master's degree in operations. We learned how to really operate that business. If it hadn't been for Greenbrier, I'll bet you we would have been out of business in three years. But they're not mutually exclusive, right? Had it not been for Perimeter, you probably would have never opened a second store. Probably. You would have said, let's call yeah, it quits. This thing sure. isn't working. We burned, we, you know, had you had another one of those fires, I mean, the second day you're, you're, you're done, yeah, you're finished with the quick business. I want to move to the motorcycle accident. I'm sorry, right, it was a motorcycle accident you had. It was. So you weren't in business all that long, and you have this near-fatal motorcycle accident. You were told by the doctors that you may never walk again unaided. What happened? What was this accident? So uh, I, left, I left Perimeter Mall uh, store. Um, it had been raining that day, but, you know, like the Atlanta weather, you know, it rained for a little bit, and then the sun came out, but streets were still wet. It was about six weeks after we started the company. And I was about maybe five miles from my home. And I came around, came off the interstate and went around a corner. And I found out later what happened. But the motorcycle rear wheel locked up. I was going about 25 miles an hour. And the motorcycle just went completely out from under me. I went over the handlebars and hit, my, hit myself head first into a telephone pole. Uh, basically knocked myself out, hit the ground, and had a 98% dislocate of my left leg and pretty much mangled my right one. Broke my nose, well, I didn't break my nose, but I split my nose open. And um, when I basically came, became conscious, um, I, you know, I was rushed to Northside Hospital. And, um, you know, I was had two doctors standing over my bed basically saying you're going to live but you'll probably never walk normally again you'll need some type of aid either you know canes or crutches but you're going to live and you know I'm, I was you know 33 years old at the time and I figured to myself well that's better than not waking up at all and so I well you know I started doing rehab it was a different world in in 1977 as far as rehab and prognosis when you were 33 years old. It was not the way the world is today where everybody's a fitness crazy person, you know, it's just different. So the prognosis for a 33 year old guy was, so, so what if you're gonna be on two kids? You know, it's a big deal, your life, your athletic life is over anyway. So what difference does it make? Well, the amazing thing is you not only walked again and, and fully recovered, but you started biking and, or maybe continued biking and, and no, really- no. Uh, I had not, I had not been on a bike since I was 13 years okay, old. Okay, so all of a sudden you start bicycling and to the point where you won speed records in multiple transcontinental events, which is crazy to think of doing in any circumstance, let alone after an accident like that. What was behind the quest? Was it trying to prove something to the doctors, to prove something to yourself? It seems like uh, while you're trying to run a company, that's a lot to take on. Well, um, it's hard to really explain to someone unless they perhaps have had the same set of circumstances. I've been an athlete my life, my whole life, uh, in one form or another. And when you lose that physical part of your life, it's not good enough, for at least it wasn't for me, to just give up, let's say, canes and be able to walk without canes. It wasn't enough. I had to prove to myself that I was whole. And so when I started biking, I never, like the cookie business, I never intended that was gonna be my business. When I started biking, it was because I couldn't run anymore. I had been a runner. And so I needed something for aerobics. So I had a stationary bike and then a regular bike. And um, I decided one day that I was gonna ride my bike from uh, Dunwoody, Georgia up to Helen 
Georgia, which is about 91 miles. And I figured, you know, if I could do this, that would, that would be pretty good. And it took me 12 hours. <clears throat> I rode the last five miles with one leg because my right leg cramped up so bad. I couldn't even use it to pedal, but I managed to get across into Helen. And as I crossed the river into Helen, Georgia, I was overwhelmed by the fact that I had been so lucky that I had been tenacious enough uh, to want to get my life back and that maybe if I did something on the bike, uh, that could set an example for people that they would know they just can't give up. And so at the same time we were building the cookie business, I got this crazy idea to ride my bike from Savannah, Georgia to San Diego, California. And uh, so I did that in 82 and um, and broke or, you know, set a record from Savannah to San Diego. And then 83, um, I was, I, well, my first record was 15 and a half days. And my, in 83, uh, I was on a nine day pace, uh, 370 miles from San Diego when I got hit by a dust devil, blown off my bike and broke my collarbone and the ride was over. And then in 1984, uh, I rode one more time, broke my record by almost five days. I got across the country in 11 days, eight hours and 15 minutes. And um, and then in 1989, I joined a four-man team to do the race across America and rode from Los Angeles to New York about 3,000 miles in five days, one hour and eight minutes. And that's the fastest crossing of America ever by bicycle and the fastest 3,000 miles ever covered under human power. And here we are in 2017, and both records still stand. It's incredible. If you look back, do you think the planning, the goal setting, the determination, the accomplishments that you did on the bike, did that have a positive impact on you as a businessman? Are the two connected in some way? More than I ever expected. I, I, I knew when I set out in 1982 to ride across the country. If I could get across, I knew I could get my physical life back. But I never imagined the effect it was going to have on my business life in 1984 when I broke my own record. When I came back in 1984, I saw the cookie company in a very different light. I, it was like somebody had taken blinders off of me. The company was doing very well. And we were still growing, but not growing the way we had. And one of the things I realized was that we were seven years into the business and that the palette of consumers had changed. And there was a lot of competition now in the cookie business. I mean, besides pure cookie stores, everybody was selling cookies and pretty good cookies. And our recipe had really not changed. And, you know, we figured, boy, you know, if, if it ain't broke, you know, don't, you know, don't fix it. Well, I learned if it ain't broke, you haven't looked hard enough. And so I began to look at the business in a different light. And in 80, by the fall of 1984, I recognized that we, we had to make some major changes. We had about 70 stores at the time. And uh, I started to think about what, what needed to be changed, what could stay the same. I brought my team in and I said, I want you to do an evaluation and look at the business, look at our competition, figure it out. They came back couple weeks later and basically said yeah things are pretty good you know what really I discovered was the good was keeping us from being great and that became a big lesson for me really for the rest of my business life we went back into the great American cookie company which at the time was the original great American chocolate chip cookie company we changed everything changed the recipe changed the name changed the store design changed the way we trained our people and in the spring of, uh, in May of 1985, almost a year to the day that I finished my, my transcontinental bicycle ride from Savannah to San Diego after our cookie company convention, which we implemented all these changes. And the, what it did for the company was unbelievable. So it, it gave you the confidence to make hard choices. It gave you courage to reach for bigger goals or some combination of all that. It did all of that. I mean, everything you just said, but more than anything, when you ride across the country in some of the conditions I had and you have to dig so deep to keep going, you find the strength within yourself that you may not have ever found any other way. 
And so when I looked at the problems of the cooking company and compared it to riding, let's say, the last five miles of my bike ride, it was nothing compared to that. And I also knew that I understood our business pretty well at the time. And I knew that we could just be a much better company. And, you know, the rest really is cookie history because we wound up becoming the big, largest franchisor of cookie stores. But more than anything else, we were not just the largest. We were the best. The product was the best. People were the best. Service was the best. Everything about what we did went back to the roots of the company, which was not having 400 stores, but having a store that was as as good as it possibly could be. And that that mantra for the company, I hope to this day, is still there. It's not about being the biggest. It's about being the best. Interesting. If you look back at a silver lining from that accident, had you not had the accident, probably wouldn't have set out that transcontinental quest. And had that not happened, you wouldn't have had that inner strength you're talking about to reevaluate the business and make some of these tough choices, which would then allow you to have the future business that you ended up having. So Yeah. So so you when we did all this, you know, it sounds easy now, but it was a lot of hard work. Uh, it was a revolution in the company, which I never wanted to go through again. But I knew we would constantly have evolution. And so what we did, some of the principles and practices we put into place to change the company became the way we operated. Every week, we brought in competition products. We brought in different best practices that we saw in other operations and evaluated them once a week. And we made a lot of minor changes to our product constantly over the years because as we got bigger, we could mill our own flour, we could develop our own chocolate. We did a lot of things as time went along to make sure that we were staying on top of our game. We never had to have a revolution again, but we continually evolved. A lot of entrepreneurs out there have a tough time scaling, even when they have the underpinnings of a great business because frankly, they're control freaks. Were you that way originally? Uh, Were you a micromanager? was learning to delegate and trust others, becoming more of a leader and less than just a pure doer. Was that a difficult transition or did it come naturally to you? Probably in the beginning, um, it would, it did. I don't know if it came natural or not, but in the beginning when we had, you know, virtually no money, I mean, I was pretty much a control freak because I had to make sure that everything we did turned out okay. And, you know, it's not, it's not the, be- you know, if you're an entrepreneur, it's not a question of, of whether you're going to have a problem or get knocked down. It's a question of how you deal with the problem and how many times you're willing to get back up. And so one of the things I began to realize was that I didn't have to be the smartest guy in the room. A good leader knows what they don't know. And I started surrounding myself with people that knew more than I did in specific areas of the business and trusted them uh, to run those areas of the business. That is it. But that doesn't mean that I didn't bring my own skill set uh, to the area. I learned from them, and I think they learned from me. You know, I, I would say that my single th- goal or thing I do best is what I learned from Irving Settler, which is take care of your customer. Just take care of your customer. Make them... Make them believe and love your business. They will become your best advertising, your best salespeople. They'll bring customers in. Uh, make, your, make your brand a brand religion. Be, create evangelists. And so um, I didn't micromanage the business. In fact, I, I trusted the people to run their areas of the business. But they had to understand that it was all about taking care of customers. They were gonna, not going to cut any corners. We're going to take care of customers. And so many businesses today have just lost that. Well, like you said, you weren't, you didn't view yourself in the cookie business per se, but the service business. And when you think that way, it allows you to make the right decisions along those lines. You have to, you have got to think about things from a customer's point of view. And a lot of companies don't do that. They're having to learn to do it because the world is different today. And, um, the world is ever connected and nobody is afraid to blog or put something out on the internet 
that's a bad experience. And what a lot of people don't realize today, social media and the internet can create a customer experience that is better, could be better than it's ever been. Because you have a way to communicate that's inexpensive and goes directly to the heart of your business. And a lot of people are scared of it as opposed to embracing it. I agree 100%. Easier said than done. The transparency that it allows the piercing of the corporate veil is very tough for some companies to embrace. Others say this is what a brand is all about, is having these authentic relationships uh, and serving customers and, and having a real two-way dialogue. It's a very different world today than it was back when you started this. I want to fast forward in between the cookie business uh, and Caribou Coffee, you ran for U.S. Senate. What in the world prompted you to get into politics? Well, first I ran uh, for the House. I ran uh, for the House of Representatives against the then Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. I got in because I really wanted to try to make a difference. I, I wanted to run for office for all the right reasons. I wanted someone to represent the district the way I thought someone should, not care about being reelected, re but just doing the right thing. Now, you know, who knows when you get there if you can hold on to that, but I thought I could. And so when I lost that race, and it was over, it was a shocking end for me because, and, and not so much losing the race, but people don't realize if you're a business person, what it's like the next day. If you're in business and something doesn't go right, you start working on how to figure it out and fix it. But if you're in an election and you lose, it's over. So I woke up the following morning after the race. I called my campaign manager and said, Kate, what do we do now? And she said, well, we pack up all this stuff and close the office. No, I said, no, 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 I don't mean that. What about all the issues we were concerned about? She said, Michael, it's over. You lost. There's nothing you can do about those issues. And it just, it, it really was hard. And so a year later, when the opportunity to run for the U.S. Senate opened up, uh, I decided, you know, to go for it with the same basic issues that I cared about. And when that didn't work out, um, I f finally figured out that you could work on a lot of those issues as a private citizen. In fact, maybe even have more impact. I probably should have learned that sooner and maybe not have done it. But I'll tell you one thing. This is a great country. And if you have the opportunity and the desire to do it, whatever the outcome is, you should do it. You got to step up. And I learned a lot from those two races. So, Michael, you sell the cookie business. You run for House. You run for Senate. doesn't go well. At this point, clearly you could have retired. No one was forcing you to work again. You could have started another company. But an offer came along to join this private company selling coffee called Caribou Coffee. What was behind that? What was it about the opportunity that attracted you? Well, I did a uh, um, consulting project for them on a people that owned it happened to have been based out of Atlanta. And they wanted, the company wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't growing. Uh, it just was not doing what they wanted it to do. How many stores at the time, roughly? They had about maybe 200 stores. Most, mostly in Minneapolis, around Minneapolis. They probably had 100 and 10 stores, I think, maybe around, you know, Minnesota, that greater area. But uh, so I started doing a uh, uh, research project for them. And what, I, what, what happened, it, it was really unbelievable. At the very end of the project, after going to about 40 or 50 of their stores, including here in Atlanta, it hit me like a ton of bricks that this company could be unbelievable. And here's what hit me. I, at the very last store I went to, I was sitting in the store with, having a cup of coffee, and I saw a customer come in with a caribou T-shirt on. And I had seen that everywhere I had gone. I had seen it in Washington. I had seen it in Chicago. I saw it in Atlanta. And I saw it now in Minneapolis. And I thought to myself, have I ever been to a Starbucks and ever seen anyone wearing a Starbucks t-shirt? And the answer is no. Because Starbucks was about being a commodity that was convenient. Caribou was a religion. 
people were loyal to the brand. And that got me really excited because I had always wanted to be involved with a company like a Harley Davidson or an Apple where you've got these evangelists out there that are, you know, if you if you got a PC and you can meet somebody that's got an Apple computer, they're going to be sitting there telling you, what, what are you doing with that? Why? Why aren't you having on? Why aren't you? Why don't you have an Apple computer? Yeah, they're zealots. Yeah. And the same thing with Harley. I mean, Harley Davidson came back from, you know, where it almost went out of business because of the evangelist following that it had from the people that own Harley's. Uh so the point so the point was I got very excited about the business and came back, we started negotiating and I took over the company in January of two thousand and three, eventually took it public uh in two thousand and five, which frankly was not something I was I was really in favor of doing. I really didn't want to take the company public. If they wanted to monetize their investment, I really felt like a better move would have been to sell the company. Because um Everybody tells you that running a public company, you know, you just you just run the company and don't worry about stock price. You know, just build a great company and eventually the price will come back. It's just not true. Because when you be, it, that may be fine for the majority owners of the business, but when you have, you know, some family that buys your stock in Topeka, Kansas, and they show up at your annual meeting and wonder why the stock has not done well, it's a lot of pressure. You wind up under that 90-day cycle of trying to figure out how to meet expectations. So we went public in 2005. In 2006, we already saw there was a change in the marketplace. I wish I had been smart enough to realize that there was a downturn of the economy. You know, they always used to talk about the Big Mac index, uh, when people stopped buying Big Macs and switched to hamburgers, uh, it was an indication that the economy was getting soft. They didn't stop buying hamburgers. They just stopped buying Big Macs because they were more expensive. Well, this should be the latte index because what we found was that people who were buying fancy coffee started coming less frequent from five times a week to three times a week to two times a week and started switching from fancy coffee to just coffee of the day. They weren't giving up caribou completely, although some did. But Starbucks was having the same issues. The economy started turning down, I would get bet you, at the beginning of 2006, and really, you know, collapsed by the, the end of 2008. And um, anyway, it was, but caribou, I'm very proud of what I did at caribou. When I got to caribou, you know, the company was going virtually nowhere. Uh, I created three new divisions for the company. Commercial division. I created a, uh, a non-traditional uh, uh, licensing agreement. And I created an inter I, I opened that caribou up to the international world. Uh, I opened up the Middle East. I opened up uh, Korea. Um, and the commercial business today is enormous. You know, selling you know, big box retailers, you know, like Costco and, you know, Kroger and, you know, major, major grocery chains. When I got there, we're, you know, in the, in the, in the commercial business, they talk about how many doors you're in. When I came to Caribou, we were in 20 doors. When I left Caribou, we were in almost 20,000 doors. So it was all about driving top line. Were you in any way looking at the business? You mentioned earlier that you approached the cookie business and saw it through a different lens that allowed you to be successful where others weren't. The way you merchandise, the way you promote, uh, the way you treat the customer. Did you view the coffee business through a different lens as well? If you were looking at, obviously, Starbucks uh, is the 800-pound gorilla there. Did you do things differently uh, to, to grow or was it just about? No, we had, a, we had to completely transform the company. Uh, the company had really lost its way in, 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 every, in every angle. I mean, some of the caribou stores were, were still tied to the way they began, which was great product, great customer service. As a matter of fact, what I did is I put together uh, with a tremendous training woman that worked uh, at Caribou, a woman named Deb Jones. Um, we put together a video, uh, which we called the Caribou Experience. And we changed our mission statement at Caribou to Caribou Coffee, an experience that makes the day better uh, when I first got there and, and created a whole new set of core values for the business. I mean, it was a huge transformation. 
uh, for the company. But it, it was not just about, Caribou lost its way. Uh, basically, they thought everything was about speed of service. They thought it was all about, you know, giving the customer that fancy drink in less than five minutes. Well, that it was. That was part of it. But you also, uh, I, I've, I've created a formula a long time ago called P like Peter, E like Edward, S like Sam. So P plus E uh, plus S equals big E, small f, the experience factor. And if anyone knows anything about algebra, if, if you create a formula and you take away one part of the formula, the answer is different. So what I taught our people at Caribou and at the cookie company was this, you had a, this formula had to work for every customer, not just a piece of it. If you give a customer a great product but terrible service, the experience is not the same. If you give them a great product and great service but the store is filthy, it's not the same. I mean, not to throw out the cliche, but you're as strong as the weakest link is, is the point of this. Yeah, maybe. But, but the point is that this is something you have to do constantly. And so we were able to turn the company around from negative same store sales within three or four months of my getting there. We turned positive and ran some of the strongest double digit same store sales increases for, you know, years to come. And, you know, I also knew <clears throat> that Caribou could not survive just on a store basis, that we had to create these other divisions. So you, you create all these divisions. You take the company through enormous growth. And as you pointed out, probably wasn't the right time to take the company public, but they went public. The stock doesn't quite do as well as the, as the growth would indicate. Was that a pretty tough experience for you to go through? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. It was terrible. I want to move over to this idea about mentoring. You mentioned a mentor you had early on who was very influential in your success. And I've read that you mentor a lot of other entrepreneurs. Of the people that you mentor, do you see a common theme in terms of areas that these entrepreneurs struggle with? What do you see the biggest challenge that most of these folks have? I think they, more than anything, are looking for validation for what they believe. Uh, I think they, want to, they just want to have a sense that what they're doing is the right path. I never thought I'd ever say this about myself, but, you know, maybe a little gray-haired experience and uh, can validate them. And I think sometimes experience does help somebody that's beginning to help them avoid perhaps mistakes in, in a direction that they were taking the company. I can't be specific, but I know there's been a number of young people that I've talked with that we, we change the direction of what they were doing, or we changed their limitation of thinking about what they were doing. You know, I, I guess in my career, I mean, I've, I've always thought of myself as a pretty good problem solver. You know, I think a lot of them are just looking for that. They're looking for somebody that can say, you know, I've gotten to this point. Now, how do I, how do I make that next step forward? I don't have all the answers, but what I've generally found is why you know, we were born with two ears and one mouth, and that's so that you can listen more and talk less. What I've really found with a lot of the people I've talked with and worked with is that if you, if they've got, if there was their idea and they're building a business, what you have to do is just give them a dialogue to talk through it, and they generally will figure it out themselves. But having somebody that's been there that can, you know, talk them through it, I think really helps a lot. I read, a, I don't know if it was a talk you gave somewhere or an interview where you said that the biggest handicap we face are the limitations we place on our vision and our imagination. Could you expand on that a little bit? I think everyone, um, well, not everyone, I would say that a lot of people impose self-limits on themselves and that it really depends on what you want to do. I mean, I, I talk to people all the time that talk about starting their own business and they'll say, well, you know, I'm not sure if this is the right time. You know, it's like, so my always, my classic example is, well, uh, I started the cookie company with $8,000. Interest rates were 18%, eventually went to 22%. Uh, percent. And if anyone had said when was a bad time to open a business, it had to be then. Because the truth is, as bad as things have ever been, it's never been that bad. We've never seen 
uh, those kind of interest rates. You know, the most important thing you can do is do it. And if you, have, if, you, if you really want to be in your own business or you want to change your career, you want to get back into shape, whatever it might be, just don't impose these limits on yourself. You're not going to know whether you could have done it until you try. And what's the worst that will happen? You don't do it, but at least you know you've, you've made the attempt to do it and that more than likely you'll learn something from it and it'll help you in the next, time, next thing that you try. And, you know, if I look from where I came, you know, as a poor kid um, growing up, having to go to work at a very young age, I think I never want to go back there. So that's certainly very motivating. But more than anything else, I always knew that if I didn't at least try to do something beyond what most people said I was capable of, because that's the other thing. People are surrounded by doomsayers and people who will tell you what your limits are. You just have to not believe them. You just got to find your own strength and do it. When you look back at all the success you've had, there's some amount of it that's just talent. There's some amount that's really hard work and, and grit, for lack of a better word. And there's some amount that's, that's, that's luck and timing. How would you look back and attribute the success to you? First of all, I hate the word success. I hate it. Uh, because it always indicates like you've reached some milestone. Uh, now, I know I'm more successful today than I used to be because I know when I go to hotels, I don't take the little bars of soap anymore. I do, however, grab all the shampoos I can get my hands on. So maybe that is an indication of success. But, the, but more importantly, I've had things that have not gone well in my life uh, throughout my career, both personal and business. And if you look around and try to blame other people for those setbacks, you'll learn nothing. If you begin to, and have the strength to look at those setbacks and figure out what your own responsibility is, that's going to teach you a hell of a lot more than your own success. Because most of the time, success, you're too busy patting yourself on the back to really learn anything from it. But setbacks are, for a lack of a word, failure. If you can really look and understand what you attributed to that, you can make the next move and, in fact, find that path to self-improvement and success. So knowing what you know today, if you could jump in that proverbial time machine, go back decades and give the 20-something Michael Coles some sage advice, what would it be? I guess the advice I would give someone is this. Don't let the people around you determine your destiny. Don't let the fact that you don't have everything you need to do what you want to do that not everything is in place because it never will be. You will forget potholders just like I did. And potholders have become the metaphor of my life. Knowing that anything I do, no matter how well planned, I'm not going to think of everything. The question is how you deal with it. And that's what young people have to understand. You're never going to have all the answers. When I was in my 20s, and by the time I reached 40, I really figured out in my life that I knew all the answers. And by the time I was 40, I figured out I was right. I did know all the answers. My problem was I didn't know all the questions. And that's what young people have to understand. You're not going to know everything because you can't know all the questions. Michael, this has been incredibly insightful, inspirational, and, and a lot of fun. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's been good to be here. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time.